Well, I apologize for that clunky introduction, everybody. It looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, my name is Brian Benich, though, uh, here supporting HDIAC. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here joining us for this webinar. I was intending to, to give a little introductory video about HDIAC to you all, but um, again, having a bit of technical difficulty, so I apologize for that. Um, in lieu of that, let me just give a brief introduction to uh, HDIAC. HDIAC is the um, Homeland Defense Institute or Information Analysis Center, excuse me. Um, we are one of three information analysis centers under the DOD. Um, our, our mission is to support the, the DOD and other government customers in finding information to um, help uh, give sort of a head start to whatever research or engineering or scientific projects they're working on. Um, so we're here to help find good information to help hopefully reduce some of the um, redundancy and duplicative work that occurs within the government and DOD uh, when it comes to research and engineering. So uh, we want to help connect you with, with folks who are going, doing good work so that um, you can collaborate, uh, maybe not repeat work that's already been done, um, come up with some ways of innovating that, that work topic, et cetera. So uh, one of the chief ways that we do that is through technical inquiries, which is a free service to um, government personnel or uh, contractors or industry or academia supporting any government uh, contractor program. Um, any technical inquiry, any question you want to pose to us, uh, it, free of charge, we are fully funded to do some research to answer that question for you um, in a, a reasonable amount of time. We allocate about four hours of research time uh, per question that comes in. Um, so I encourage you to take, a, take advantage of that service. Uh, that is your tax dollars at work to help generate some more information for the, the larger projects that you might be working on. You can get more information about that, find the, the, the portal to submit your question at the website, hdiac.org. Um, and one way we also achieve our mission is through webinars like this. Um, and so I'm very pleased to have Dr. Balaji here. We wanna make sure we uh, get information out. So again, work's not repeated. So we're pleased to have Dr. Balaji here to give a presentation on, um, on, on this topic today. Um, and so before I hand it over to him, just a couple quick um, top, quick pointers here about the webinar platform. For those who are in the webinar, this is a, an any meeting, or sorry, a WebEx platform. Um, and the one important, important feature I want to alert you to is the Q&A uh, form or, or portal or section of this platform. So you may need to click the three ellipses, maybe on the bottom right of your, your screen to find the Q&A. Um, I want to distinguish that from the chat. There, there is a chat feature, um, but the Q&A um, section is important because at any time during the presentation, if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Balaji, please enter it there uh, in that Q&A section, and we will have uh, a time for Q&A at the end of his presentation. So uh, we'll take those questions as they're received. So again, if you have any questions during the presentation, just drop them into the Q&A. Um, and so uh, without further ado, let me brief, let me introduce Dr. Bal introduce Dr. Balaji. He is uh, the director of, of REACTS, which he will be speaking about today. The, um, Cytogenic uh, Biodosimetry Laboratory, where he focuses on developing automated high throughput triage tools for radiological and nuclear mass or casualty incidents. He has over 20 years of experience in radiation biology, specializing in radiation biodosimetry um, and radiation induced biological effects in diverse human and animal cell model systems. Dr. Balaji has also been actively collaborating with several national and international institutions to develop novel and minimally invasive bookmark, uh, biomarkers for detecting radiation-induced early and late health effects. And so we're pleased to have Dr. Balaji here today to present on radiation biodesometry, where we are and where we need to go. So, uh, Dr. Balaji, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and hand the mic over to you. Brian, can you also give me the control for the slides, please? Yes, yes, I will do that right now. Um, Go and you should be getting the privileges to control the slides and audio is coming in loud and clear. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brian, for hosting this webinar. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Gregory Nichols and uh, John Clemens uh, for inviting me to give this webinar. Uh, my name is Arevan Ambalaji. Uh, I'm the director of uh, REACT's uh, Cytogenetic Biodesmetry Laboratory in Oak Ridge. 
so those of you uh, who may not uh, know about REACT, REACT stands for Radiation Emergency Assistance Center Training Site. We are located in Oakridge. Um, so we are the asset uh, for Department of Energy and also National Nuclear Security Administration. <clears throat> so today I'm going to share with you uh, my views and thoughts on radiation biodosimetry. And I will also um, uh, give you uh, some insights where we need to go in the future. And I thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk today. I will briefly introduce you to biodosimetry, um, especially for those who do not know what is biodosimetry, uh, some of the advantages of biodosimetry, and I will discuss briefly different biodosimetry tools and which are uh, potential uh, point of care testing, um, I will also briefly talk about the current limitations of uh, POC tools, point of care tools, and I will also briefly discuss the future development and perspectives and finally conclusions. So what is biodosimetry? Uh, biodosimetry is a measurement of biological response as a surrogate for radiation dose. So biological indicators are those that show a measurable response to ionizing radiation. And these bioindicators also should show a response which is dependent on absorbed radiation dose. So bioindicators usually involve uh, DNA, RNA, proteins, and lipids, as well as a yeah, wide range of uh, metabolic byproducts. So bioindicators are not only useful for predicting the absorbed radiation dose, but also predicting the health outcome in some cases. So dose estimation can be performed by several means. Uh, clinical symptoms like nausea and vomiting can be used um, to um, estimate the absorbed radiation dose. And then blood cell counts, uh, white blood lymphocytes and red blood cells and platelets, so they all decline as a function of radiation dose. So the extent of decline can indicate the um, absorbed radiation dose. And there are a number of uh, cytogenetic and molecular biomarkers that are widely used to estimate the absorbed radiation dose. So then the question is, why do we need dose estimation? So dose estimation is useful not only for immediate medical management, but also for long-term monitoring for some of the radiation induced stochastic effects or probability effects such as cancer. So imagine a hypothetical population where all are exposed to the same radiation dose. So when, if you use a physical dosimeter, so the response would be uh, more uh, homogeneous homogeneous, but the biodosimeter responses will be heterogeneous because not all of us respond the same way to ionizing radiation. So there is a tremendous amount of inter-individual variation in DNA repair response. And physical dosimeters, they can only measure the dose external to the body, but the biodosimeters can estimate the dose that is absorbed inside the body, which is really critical because the absorbed radiation is going to affect our tissues and organs. So biodosimetry is also essential for medical treatment decisions, usually zero to two gray and no treatment uh, required. So these are people with uh, DNA proficient um, and competent individuals. So the doses uh, from 2 gray to 7.5 gray, uh, so we can treat this with antibiotics, transfusions, and nursing. Um, so the doses ranging from 2 gray to 10 gray, uh, cytokine therapy is useful. And for those individuals receiving 7.5 to 10 gray, they are ideal candidates for bone marrow transplantation. So the the lethal dose uh, that kills 50% of the exposed to population in 60 days is estimated to be 3.5 to 4 gray without treatment. 
but this LD50 dose can be increased to seven to eight gray with antibiotics and nursing. I must emphasize that all these doses refer to photons, namely X-rays and gamma rays. So there are many situations like a radiation dispersal device, improvised nuclear device or nuclear detonation on radiological terrorism, which can potentially expose several hundreds and thousands of people to radiation. So we need to develop robotic high throughput platforms to estimate the absorbed radiation dose. So in the case of large scale radiological nuclear incidents, we have to prioritize the individuals for medical intervention. So we cannot uh, treat everyone medically, and it is also not required. So we need some point of care testing tools for an effective triage. So those individuals receiving less than two gray, they can actually go home and monitor themselves. And those receiving more than two gray, they need medical intervention. Of course, both these populations require long-term monitoring for any stochastic effects. So these are uh, some of the uh, commonly used biodosimetry tools. So the assays that are listed on the top of the slide, they are uh, basically cytogenetics based. Uh, histone H2AX is a double strand break a surrogate marker. This is a variant of histone H2A protein. Uh, this can be used for estimating the absorbed radiation dose, but the only downside of this is that the signal fades very quickly after low doses of radiation. Besides this, we have a physical dosimetry, electron paramagnetic resonance, which is usually done on uh, fingernails, toenails, uh, tooth enamel, and bone biopsies. And then lymphocyte depletion rate or lymphocyte depletion kinetics is also used for dose estimation. And then there is a pleiotora of uh, omics uh, techniques, uh, transcriptomics, measures the expression of microRNA and messenger RNA. Proteomics measures the expression of uh, proteins and also protein modifications. Genomics is basically loss or gain of uh, uh, gene copy number and also single nucleotide polymorphism and mutations. Metabolomics, of course, measures the metabolic byproducts. Recently, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, microvesicles and exosomes. Um, so they do contain a little bit of DNA, RNA, proteins, and lipids. So people are profiling those for the discovery of novel uh, markers for radiation exposure. So I will briefly touch upon each of these tools, uh, if time permits. So these are most commonly used biodosimetry tools, uh, time to emesis, uh, so the time to onset of vomiting, a lymphocyte depletion kinetics, electron paramagnetic resonance and electron spin resonance. So these are physical dosimetry techniques, gene expression, dicentric chromosome assay, and cytokinesis blocked micronucleus assay. These two assays are cytogenetics based. In our lab, we predominantly use the dicentric chromosome assay for estimating the absorbed radiation dose. So these are some of the potential biodosimeters for point of care testing. Time to emesis is actually self-reporting. Uh, no equipment is needed. Lymphocyte depletion kinetics can be performed within five minutes. It is relatively rapid. Electron paramagnetic resonance is very similar to lymphocyte depletion kinetics. It can also be performed within five minutes or so. Uh, gene expression usually takes uh, about four to seven hours. So these are uh, really rapid techniques for uh, biodosimetry. I will discuss their potential in a tiered biodosimetry approach later on. So this is uh, the correlation between time to onset of vomiting and the radiation dose. So this is over a range of two gray to 10 gray. As you can see at higher doses, there is a nice correlation between time to onset of vomiting and the patient's positive for emesis. So REM is a wonderful site. It has so many valuable sources. If you are interested in learning more about 
biodosimetry. Uh, so Dr. Blakely and his colleagues developed uh, at AFRI uh, Armed Forces Radio Biology Research Institute. So they developed a biodosimetry assessment tool which can be used for estimating the dose from the time to onset of vomiting. So there are many advantages uh, for MSS. So it's self-reporting, no equipment needed, capable of identifying a severely exposed groups. So this works really uh, for higher radiation doses, uh, potentially useful for higher doses with an early onset of MSS before 30 minutes or less. Like I showed, there is a nice correlation between time to onset of vomiting and the high uh, radiation doses and provide evidence for acute radiation syndrome, uh, which usually occurs at or around two gray of exposure. Again, all these doses refer to photons. So there are some disadvantages. Uh, may not be really specific for radiation. Sometimes uh, psychosomatic illness can also cause emesis, and the dose prediction error is almost doubled for low radiation doses. There are also some people who are asymptomatic, so they do not exhibit emesis, even though they uh, may be exposed to radiation. And the false positive rate increases with increasing time for emesis. So people use lymphocyte depletion kinetics, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the uh, early part of my talk, uh, the white blood cells, red blood cells and platelets, they all decline as a function of radiation dose. Uh, some people use uh, lymphocyte de depletion kinetics. The lymphocytes also decline as a function of radiation dose. So that information can be used to estimate the absorbed radiation dose. Again, you can use the uh, biodosimetry assessment tool, BAT, that was developed by AFRI in Bethesda. So when you do the whole blood cell counts, uh, so there are also advantages and disadvantages. So the total assay time is actually a few minutes. So that is really good for triage after large scale radiological or nuclear incidents. And the high throughput capability, uh, most useful for clinicians for appropriate uh, therapeutic strategies. Highly relevant for EARS, radiation specific diagnostic tool. And there is a decline of 50% uh, lymphocytes with the ray with the high radiation doses that occurs within 12 hours. So this potentially indicate the ARS. There are some disadvantages. There is a tremendous inter-individual variation in blood cell counts. Um, so for detecting low dose exposures based on lymphocyte depletion kinetics may be um, uh, not so precise. Um, multiple collections are required. So that is one of the downsides. So when you have several thousands of individuals for biodosimetry, a uh, collection of blood uh, three times a day uh, may prove uh, time consuming and laborious for triage. So recently, uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ronald Goins and Dr. Uh, Carol Edens, uh, so they published a paper in Health Physics so they, where they have looked at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So they use the accident registry data at REACTS. And if you are interested, you can um, go through this article, which is uh, really um, informative and useful. So a lot of people use uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Uh, just to show you, this is the neutrophil and this is the lymphocytes. You can actually count the neutrophils and lymphocytes and they estimate the ratio um, after radiation exposure. So I'm going to briefly talk about the physical dosimeters, uh, electron paramagnetic resonance and the electron spin resonance. So both these uh, methods are very similar. Uh, both these methods detect the transitions of unpaired electrons uh, with an externally applied magnetic field. So EPR can be done on tooth enamel, uh, fingernails, uh, toenails, and uh, bone uh, biopsies. Dr. Harold Swartz um, uh, from Dartmouth uh, Institute is a pioneer in EPR. And um, recently, um, there is a new development of uh, in vivo EPR spectroscopy, spectroscopy for biodosimetry. So using the EPR and ESR, uh, dose reconstruction studies have been done in uh, Chernobyl victims, 
and also Maya worker cohorts. Uh, so I was uh, searching in PubMed uh, with the terms EPR and dosimetry. I found almost 575 articles uh, published on EPR and ESR related techniques. So again, uh, it is very useful for both partial and the total body irradiation scenarios. And like I said before, it takes only five minutes uh, per individual. So it is really, really useful for triage. EPR has a dose response linearity up to 30 gray, uh, sensitive to X-rays and uh, gamma rays. I'm not sure uh, whether anybody has done EPR after high LHT radiation. Um, and the internal contamination um, uh, can also be assessed by EPR and ESR techniques. But these techniques are insensitive to a dose rate uh, because the dose rate effects are really pronounced after photons exposure. Um, it has been used for dose reconstruction in A-bomb survivors, like I mentioned, also Chernobyl and the victims of Teka River region. Um, but this assess uh, or insensitive to biological processes because uh, you are estimating the dose from the toenail, fingernails, and tooth enamel and bone biopsies, but they can be used as the first layer of triage. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the tiered biodosimetry approach. So in tier one, uh, we need the rapid segregation of exposed individuals from non-exposed individuals, and also based on the dose, whether it is two gray or less than two gray. So e EPR and ESCR, ESR techniques can be really useful for the first layer of triage. It is field deployable and is ranked at 4B. I will also um, explain uh, the scoring rubric for uh, different phases of biodosimetry development. A single EPR unit can screen almost 275 people per day. So if you have almost 10 um, uh, instruments or equipment, we can do actually thousands of samples per day. Uh, further refinement is definitely required. So the sensitivity is not really high uh, for doses less than one gray, but for triage, uh, we only need two gray or less or two gray or above. So this uh, technique would work just fine for, uh, for an effective triage. So we started collaborating uh, with uh, Dr. Shalom uh, and Dr. McKeever. Uh, McKeever, again, is a pioneer in EPR. Uh, so they are from Oklahoma State University. So we started looking at um, uh, cell phone components as emergency dosimeters. We actually use the resistors and capacitors, which are inside the cell phones, and also the uh, Gorilla glasses. Uh, so we did some study and we published this um, in um, Journal of Radiological Protection in 2022. Uh, so you can see this is the uh, delivered dose. These are with uh, gamma rays and this is the physical dose estimated from the smartphone components. So we also compared the dose prediction accuracy of um, uh, cell phone components with the gold standard dicentric chromosome assay. So the correlation was pretty good. So if you're interested, um, uh, you can uh, read through this article. Uh, so any biodosimetry tool that are under development or that is developed has to be validated with the dicentric chromosome assay. So let's move on to uh, omics uh, markers. Uh, so the transcriptomics, uh, basically the expression of uh, microRNA and messenger RNA, they are most commonly used. Uh, so each uh, human nucleus has more than 25,000 genes. Uh, after radiation exposure, uh, some of these genes are downregulated in expression, and some of these genes are upregulated. So once uh, these genes are identified, they can be used as uh, signatures for estimating the absorbed radiation dose. So this is an article uh, from Jacobs and colleagues. So this uh, article was published in the International Journal of Radiation Biology way back in 2020. So they have identified a panel of 13 uh, genes. Um, so BAGS, BBC3, CDKN1 is actually P21, DDP2, DEAD, LAPT, M5, and PCNA. All these uh, seven genes get um, elevated after radiation exposure. And there are also some genes that are down-regulated after radiation exposure, like MIC, 
part one and then drip two. And they have used the three genes for normalization. So these three genes, CDR2 and the mitochondrial ribosomal subunit, MRPS18A and MRPS5. So these genes do not get altered after radiation exposure. So they have used these three genes for normalizing the expression of radiation responsive genes and down-regulated genes. This is really important because uh, there is a tremendous amount of inter-individual variation in transcriptomics as a function of age, as a function of gender. There are a lot of confounding factors. So these normalized genes are really useful for um, estimating the absorbed radiation dose. So they have actually looked at uh, different human demographics. So they have done only the baseline expression of those 13 genes without radiation exposure. So they have looked at African-Americans, Asian, Caucasian, Hispanic, and Native Americans, and also uh, people with some confounding factors like the chronic conditions like asthma and bronchitis, burn, influenza, and trauma. So it is this a very interesting paper. So this raises the potential for using the gene expression signatures for absorbed radiation dose estimation. So there are also other developments. Uh, so the Bundeswehr Institute of Radiobiology in Munich in Germany. So this German group identified a panel of 29 genes that can predict a late occurring hematological acute radiation syndrome in baboons. And they have uh, streamlined said, their gene expression signatures, and they have now a panel of four genes uh, for hematological acute radiation syndrome. So these are DDB2, FDXR, uh, ferrodoxin reductase, uh, PAU2AF1, and BIN3. So, um, so this work was uh, predominantly uh, done by Dr. Uh, Matthias Spot and Dr. Michael Event and their colleagues. And the SDXR uh, seems to be really promising uh, for acute radiation syndrome categorization, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, recently, I heard a lecture uh, in the Conrad meeting um, from uh, Dr. Paul Okinev. So he uh, described a test which is known as the RAD TOX test. So he is actually looking at the circulating free DNA um, in, uh, in the blood and you can estimate the absorbed radiation dose. So, so this could be a potential triage tool, which is very easy to perform. So again, there are advantages and disadvantages for using gene expression signatures. So the total assay time is only seven hours. So, so it is really ideal for triage, uh, potential for uh, POC testing, uh, minimally invasive, um, so since uh, this assay uses only PCR machines, so, so 600 samples can be processed in 24 hours uh, per instrument. Um, and uh, the assay is highly uh, specific and uh, sensitive. And it can also yield uh, valuable information for ARS and also the uh, therapeutics. Uh, some of the disadvantages are, uh, like I said, the DNA repair efficiency is different in different individuals. Uh, some, some people are uh, intrinsically radiation sensitive uh, due to mutations in uh, double strand break repair genes. And some people are also maybe immune compromised uh, because of age. Uh, dose rate effects have not been examined for most of the biodesmetry tools. Uh, may not predict the health outcome, um, may not be sensitive uh, for chronic low-dose exposures. Uh, like I said, um, so we need the um, uh, gene expression signatures uh, for the cutoff dose of 2 gray. So less than 2 gray, go home, more than 2 gray, uh, you seek medical intervention. Uh, of course, uh, this assays uh, needs um, clinical validation. So this is the slide I modified. So the original slide was from Sproul et al. in radiation research published in 2016. Uh, so this is the scoring rubric uh, for uh, biodosimetry field phase of development. So the investigative phase is one and two, in vitro or ex vivo radiation model, uh, and then the neurine in vivo model, which is two. 
the early development phase is usually on non-human primates uh, like monkeys in vivo model late development phase is a human clinical trials for a and then human exposure study which is for b and finally the deployment ready which is after fda approval so these are different phases for uh, bio uh, dosimetry tool development so I have listed. I'm not uh, going. I'm not going to go through uh, the whole list of uh, uh, proteins or genes and the metabolic products briefly. Uh, so the transproteomics is at the level of 4A phase, actually human clinical trial phase. Uh, proteomics is actually at the human accident phase cases, and the metabolomics is also the human um, accidental phases. So they have found a number of uh, microRNA uh, that get modulated after radiation exposure. I'm going to briefly talk about microRNA 150 that seems to reflect uh, or correspond with the lymphocyte depletion kinetics. Uh, so there are also other microRNAs uh, after protobody radiation with the hemorrhage. Uh, in humans, uh, actually, there are only few studies, but uh, there is no uh, dose dependency. So a number of proteins have been identified in human cells, a C-reactive protein, serum amylase, uh, both show dose dependency. And there are uh, 55 proteins that have been characterized in human cells for uh, radiation exposure. So these are non-human primates. Uh, so this is for the human saliva, and these are from head and neck cancer patients. So there are also a number of uh, metabolomic products have been characterized again uh, mouse uh, humans and also non-human primates um, so what is interesting is that both taurin and xanthin um, are found commonly in all these uh, three species of radiation exposure So in collaboration with the Dr. Cahill at the Oak Ridge National Lab, um, so um, they developed a bend-off device. So what you have to do is you have to touch the surface of the skin and then the chemical readout by mass spectrophotometry. And then we can do the analysis using the online chemical analysis software. So this is an example. So where they have done the um, uh, mass spectrum of uh, human skin, basically the finger. So the PENDOF device is most sensitive for phospholipids and a variety of um, amino acids. So we did some preliminary studies using the serum and plasma, um, which were ex vivo irradiated, um, but we kind of stalled uh, due to pandemic, but I, we have to reinitiate the collaboration with the Oak Ridge National Lab to explore the possibility of using PENDOF uh, particularly for uh, cutaneous radiation injuries. So that will be really cool. And I'm also interested in looking at the, at the profiles of uh, repair competent and repair deficient individuals, basically uh, radiation sensitive human syndromes to see whether we can pick up some signatures for identifying the inherently radiosensitive population. So we did this collaborative research with the Ohio State University, uh, microRNA 150. Uh, Dr. Jacob and his team has shown the utility of microRNA 150 for dose estimation in mouse, non-human primates, and humans. So he uses this uh, dual system. Uh, so microRNA 150, uh, which is abundant um, in peripheral blood, and uh, microRNA 150 is responsive to ionizing radiation. Um, it uh, uh, declines in expression as a function of radiation dose. Higher the radiation dose, higher the decline. And he uses a non responsive microRNA 23A, which is excreted from uh, liver. And microRNA 23A does not get altered after radiation exposure. So it is a nice internal control for normalizing the expression of microRNA 150. Like I, I mentioned many times during my talk, there is a tremendous inter-individual variation um, in uh, gene expression. So we have to be really careful and we need a really good uh, internal control for normalizing the expression of the candidate genes. So uh, as a proof of concept, uh, Jacob and his colleagues uh, did the study on human acute myeloid leukemia patients 
So they received the radiation for ablation of uh, blood cells. As you can see, the microRNA 150 declines um, during the increasing days of treatment with radiation. On day 30, they received the bone marrow transplantation. You can see the microRNA 150 level increase after bone marrow transplantation. I am um, excited about this um, observation because the microRNA 150, as I said before, uh, correlates with the lymphocyte depletion kinetics because the lymphocytes also deplete as a function of radiation does. So we can use microRNA 150 effectively uh, to determine the efficacy of um, uh, medical countermeasures like neupogen or end plate. So it has a tremendous uh, potential. So, uh, in one of the collaborative projects, uh, we wanted to um, uh, determine the dose prediction accuracy of microRNA with the dicentric chromosome assay. Uh, so, we have not published this data. So, we use the in vivo mouse model system, total body radiation, with the two um, uh, radiation qualities. Uh, we used uh, neutrons and gamma rays. So, we have to publish this data. But I can tell you that um, uh, both the DCA and the microRNA correlate really well um, for the radiation dose estimation. Again, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, total assay time is less than four hours for microRNA analysis, and again, it's really good for triage. Um, so early prediction of disease outcome, uh, because this microRNA expression, especially microRNA 150, correlates with the lymphocyte depletion kinetics. So we could get valuable information for acute radiation syndrome. Um, again, interindividual variation may be huge, uh, but in this case, uh, since we are using microRNA23A as an internal control, you can alleviate um, some of the confounder effects, but not all of them. Uh, so the disease status and the pre-genetic condition, uh, they have not been tested uh, using microRNA. And again, no data on dose rate effects, uh, so lacks clinical validation. And we have to do a lot of uh, bridging experiments uh, between uh, human and non-human primates. And the reliability and uh, reproducibility, basically specificity and sensitivity have to be determined for this microRNA based biodesmetric tools. So there are also biomarkers for uh, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, so for hematopoietic system and bone marrow aplasia, yeah, FLT3 ligand is routinely used uh, for gastrointestinal tract, citrulline. Uh, many of you are aware of this. Uh, liver and cardiovascular uh, systems, oxysterols. Uh, so these are nothing but oxidized forms of cholesterol. And for salivary gland uh, amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down the complex carbohydrates such as starch. So FLT3 ligand has been successfully used to distinguish whole body exposure from partial body exposure. And most of these biodesmetric tools I described have to be tested for partial body exposure as well. So I'm going to talk about the dicentric chromosome assay, um, which is actually the bread and butter for us. Uh, so the dicentric chromosome assay is uh, known as the gold standard for radiation biodosimetry. Um, so there is an excellent manual uh, from International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Cytogenetic Dosimetry. Um, Pat Presena, um, who is a participant in this webinar, contributed to this manual. And there are also two ISO documents, uh, 19238 and 21243. So these two ISO documents describe how to perform a dicentric chromosome assay for um, large-scale uh, um, incidents. And the FDA recommends that the dicentric chromosome assay uh, has to be done to validate any newly developed biodosimetry tool um, because DCA is considered as the gold standard for radiation uh, biodosimetry. So uh, let us see how the dicentric chromosome formation occurs. Um, so irrespective of the radiation quality, uh, they all induce uh, DNA double strand breaks. So human cells nucleus has 46 chromosomes, uh, somatic cells, and um, we have shown only two chromosomes for illustration. 
so when uh, radiation passes through the cells, uh, breaks are induced on these two chromosomes. So these are broken chromosomes, and these broken chromosomes are misrejoined, and these are the eccentric fragments. And uh, we can actually look at this abnormal chromosome with the two centromeres. So before irradiation, so each chromosome has a single centromere, uh, which is also known as the primary constriction. So the normal chromosomes are monocentric uh, with only one centromere, but these abnormal chromosomes have two centromeres. Basically, we quantify the number of dicentric chromosomes in the peripheral blood lymphocytes of exposed individuals to estimate the absorbed radiation dose. Since its discovery in 1962 by Bender and Pooch, so the DCA remains as the gold standard for absorbed radiation dose estimation. So it has a number of advantages. Uh, so the low baseline frequency, that means uh, only one dicentric chromosome in a lymphocyte out of 1,000 lymphocyte cells. So the frequency is basically 0 0.001 per cell. It is independent of uh, age and gender. Uh, it is very easy to detect, like I showed you. Uh, so these chromosomes will have uh, two centromeres. And the sensitivity range is from 0.1 to 7.5 gray. Um, but if you score um, many hundreds and thousands of cells, so the sensitivity can be um, uh, even uh, less than 0.1 gray. Uh, basically, we can detect uh, the annual limit of exposure, which is actually 0 0.05 gray. Uh, it gives reproducible dose response, and it is really specific for radiation exposure. Uh, so the chemicals do not induce uh, dicentric chromosomes in um, resting lymphocytes, and it has proven in many accidents over four decades. So for every uh, cytogenetic lab, uh, a calibration curve is required for estimating the absorbed radiation dose. So what we do here, so we uh, collect the blood samples from healthy volunteers, and then uh, different oligoids uh, are irradiated with the different radiation doses. So we go always up to the, um, uh, 10 gray. Here it's only up to 5 gray. Uh, so these are the radiation doses in the x-axis, and uh, these are the dicentric frequencies per cell in the y-axis. So this is the calibration curve. Um, so this is the upper confidence limit, and this is the lower confidence limit at 95%. So once we have the calibration curve, so if we get an unknown um, exposed sample, so we simply have to estimate the dicentric frequency and then use this calibration curve to get the absorbed radiation dose. So the turnaround time for dicentric chromosome assay is actually three to four days, so which is pretty long uh, for triage. Um, so this is one of the downsides of DCA. Um, but we are actually um, uh, automating the whole process so that we can improve the high throughput sampling. So at the React CBL, uh, we wanted to automate the whole DCA process uh, right from blood collection all the way to the dose estimation. So once we have this system in place, uh, so we can actually process 512 samples per machine per instrument. So if we have four or five instruments, we can actually reach up to uh, 2,500 to 3,000 uh, samples per day. So uh, I briefly talked about a tiered approach for an effective medical triage. So in the case of um, mass casualty incidents, uh, several hundreds and thousands of people may be uh, potentially exposed to radiation. So, um, so I advocate a tiered approach. Uh, so the tier one, um, we can use any of this uh, reliable, sensitive, low false positive markers, such as the prodromal symptoms, um, so hemodose, uh, EPR, um, all the gene expression. So we can actually uh, rapidly segregate the people based on dose. So the cutoff dose for triage is actually two gray, less than two gray, um, they can go home so, uh, since there is no uh, medical intervention required. And those persons receiving more than two gray, uh, they need medical intervention. So in tier two, uh, we will do the cytogenetic validation of uh, those people uh, with exposures exceeding uh, two gray. 
So a similar approach was done in Guyana in Brazil in 1987. Uh, so there was an incident, external contamination with uh, cesium-137. So 130,000 people uh, uh, gathered in the soccer stadium. You know, Brazilians love football. So all these people gathered in the football stadium and they have screened these individuals using a Gigat Muller counter. Uh, because it is external contamination with cesium-137. But out of those 130,000 individuals, only 110 individuals require cytogenetic testing. So the tiered approach will be really effective. So we can use some rapid biodosimeters to segregate people who actually require medical intervention and then uh, uh, move on uh, from there for cytogenetic validation. So I have listed a number of considerations. Uh, so these are my personal view. Um, so some people uh, may not even uh, approve of this. Uh, so current biodosimetry assays are based mainly on low LET radiation, uh, X-rays and gamma rays. So there are a lot of uh, exposure scenarios like internal contamination through ingestion or inhalation of radionuclides, um, accumulated fractionated exposures, and mixed radiation qualities, um, for example, uh, improvised nuclear device. Uh, so we can have both gamma and neutrons. So these biodosimetry tools have to be um, uh, validated for uh, different uh, radiation exposures. And the bioindicators and biomarkers uh, should be useful for predicting and monitoring acute radiation syndrome. And the most important thing is that the biodosimetry methods need to be modeled for special populations. So we don't really talk about them. So we are always talking about the healthy uh, DNA repair competent individuals. And so there are persons with the pre-existing disease states, uh, incurrent radiation sensitivity, um, owing to mutations, uh, for example, ataxia, telangiectasia mutated, or people with uh, mutations in the breast cancer susceptibility gene, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, so these individuals are uh, uh, radiation sensitive uh, and also people with um, uh, polymorphism in genes. Um, so uh, if they have polymorphisms in DSP repair genes, probably the radiation response may be um, uh, diminished or declined and also the pediatric and the geriatric population. Um, so it's well known that the pediatric population is uh, fairly radiation sensitive because a large number of uh, uh, cells in their bodies are still proliferating, um, so they are uh, more sensitive. And the geriatric populations, uh, they may suffer from a decline in uh, immune response and also uh, DNA repair uh, capacity. And we have to develop organ-specific biomarkers um, because some organs are uh, more radiation sensitive than other organs. Um, so there is a substantial knowledge and gap exists between biodosimetrists and physicians. Uh, so um, the scientists must provide the kind of information that clinicians can use uh, for medical intervention. So there is a huge gap. Uh, so um, there has been a lot of talks in bringing up uh, clinical biodosimetry. Um, so that would be a, really a good thing to do. And also the existing emergency management concept of operations for radiological event uh, planning needs to be integrated with the biodosimetry methodologies uh, for developing point of care testing tools for field use. Uh, so thank you all for your attention. Um, so I know that I went a little fast uh, during the middle of my talk, but if you have any questions, you can always contact me or I can answer some of the questions um, that are in the chat. I thank you again for attending this webinar and I will stop here and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. That was, that was great. There were uh, some questions that came in. Um, so I want to make sure we kind of just jump straight into them in the interest of time. Um, Dr. Balaji, I don't know if you can read them. I'll read them out loud as well. But if you if you take a peek at that Q&A section, um, you can get a sort of advanced read of them as well. So I'm just going to read them out loud and, and give you a chance to respond. Um, the, the first one, uh, maybe kind of a 
uh, is referring to a paper that you referenced. It says, uh, what was the sample type used in the Jacobs et al. paper, um, which would have been an earlier slide? Yeah, the, uh, uh, serum uh, was used. In some cases, plasma was used. Oh, okay, well, yeah, quick and easy. Yes. All right, uh, next, next question. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, next question says, uh, early on, you provided a dose chart uh, guiding uh, cytokine therapy, bone marrow transplants, et cetera. I assume you're alluding, you're alluding the doses are whole body equivalent. However, in most cases, dose distribution is heterogeneous. How do you manage this? Uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, most of the exposures are uh, largely heterogeneous. Um, so, but these dose estimates uh, are for whole body um, equivalent doses. Um, so, I really do not uh, have any experience. Um, so, uh, so these are uh, actually generalized to scheme for medical treatment options. Um, so, these are for whole body radiation, but I know that uh, it's very difficult to have a homogeneous exposure when you are an adult individual. You know, in kids, yes, you can have a uniform exposure. But even in many of the accidents, uh, you know, uh, A-bomb survivors uh, or even Chernobyl or something like that. So the exposure is always heterogeneous, uh, probably uh, 50 to 70 uh, percent. Um, yes, that's a very valid question, but uh, I don't think I know the answer for that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, um, next question says, or asks, uh, could you clarify the test procedure for miRNA? Uh, this would be a what this would be i guess or would this be a pcr test yes it is a pcr test i think there are a lot of kits available for um, uh, for the isolation of microRNA uh, from different body fluids uh, so we actually used the commercially available ones uh, i don't really remember which one we used um, so um, i can uh, send uh, our papers um, if someone is interested uh, so it's all detailed in the materials and methods Yes, it's a PCR based technique. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, next question is how did the, how do the dose results using the, these tools compared to the dose results determined from NASA's hemodose tool, which equate to white cell and uh, platelet counts to a dose were used to screen an astronaut's ability to tolerate cosmic or solar radiation exposure. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think if you compare the dose estimates uh, from uh, different assays, uh, so they are bound to be different. Uh, so they will not be really consistent um, because the endpoints are different. Um, so, um, so for uh, blood cell counts, uh, also I pointed out um, some variations. Um, so it is also. Uh, really a short term uh, analysis. Uh, so we don't know what happens during the long term. Um, let me. Um, mm -hmm. It could be definitely used. Uh, you know, it can be definitely used to screen an astronaut's ability. Uh, but what they are trying to do now is the uh, microbiome analysis, but gut microbiome analysis. I haven't uh, talked about that. So that field is actually growing. Um, as I uh, remember, um, so people are actually um, selecting uh, the people with the very good DNA repair uh, efficiency, you know, even for our exploration to Mars. So the idea is, uh, so if we can identify the genes that can boost our DNA repair response, so that will be ideal for astronauts, um, you know. Um, so I don't know, like I said, I think, you know, if you use different biosymmetry tools, uh, so it will not be really consistent, but you can get approximate um, uh, dose. Uh, you know, it right. cannot be really precise. But I often wonder: uh, Do we really need a precise uh, absorbed radiation dose? You know, so we don't have any treatment for two gray or two point five gray. You know, so right. it doesn't need to be precise as long as you are in the ballpark of the doses that can um, uh, identify ARS. Um, you know, All right? Good. No, thank you. All right, uh, let's see, next question. Um, where, are we? where are we go? 
Uh, a number of the biomarkers shown could benefit from a broad survey of the distribution for the expression of those markers across different populations and demographics. Which biomarkers should be a priority for these types of surveys? Uh, I, I showed the, the paper of uh, Jacobs et al. Um, so they have identified 13 genes and the German group has identified four genes. Um, so they have done also a lot of uh, animal studies in HPs, uh, like I said, baboons. Um, so I would prefer that um, either the screening of those four genes, uh, which the German group um, demonstrated, and also the 13 genes could be effectively used uh, because uh, like I uh, showed you briefly, they already uh, checked uh, different human demographics and uh, there is not much difference in the baseline expression of those genes. But of course, so they have not really uh, tested of radiation exposure. Uh, but in my opinion, I think uh, so those 30, 13 genes and then this is four genes and some of the genes are common. Uh, for example, the DDB2, um, a DNA damage binding protein, which is actually common. Uh, so the Jacobs group also identified that and the German group also identified that for ARS. So I think those genes could be um, a good uh, tools uh, for uh, dose estimation, I believe. Okay, good. For TN1. Yep. All right. Uh, I see one. Are there available POC devices for PCR? Um, yes, they are. Um, so uh, that is a group in um, in Arkansas. Uh, so they developed the handheld monitor. Um, so you have to just put in a drop of blood, and then um, the lysis and the RNA extraction. Everything happens in that uh, uh, small um, uh, equipment. And uh, they can actually read out the results. Yes, there are there are a lot of improvements, and there are a lot of developments in the handheld uh, PCR type machines. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Let's see another one that we have in queue here. Uh, it says, with regards to uh, genomics and H2AX analysis, some studies show uh, various up and down regulation of gene products. So how confident are you in your dose estimation since the gene regulation seems to be dose and dose rate dependent? Uh, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent question. Um, so um, I'm not a great fan of omics, uh, to be honest, uh, because the, the transcript omics uh, change uh, quite a lot uh, during uh, different parts of the day. Um, so the gene expression profile is uh, you know, always changing. Um, so, uh, I don't think uh, you can get consistent results. Uh, so, um, you know, really, I think people have shown dose dependency. Uh, like I said, uh, so more experiments need to be performed. And uh, uh, so the gamma H2AX, um, you know, uh, people use uh, for counting the foci, or uh, you can also do flow cytometry. That is more uh, DNA damage response. Uh, so we are only looking at DNA double strand break induction and their disappearance. Um, but uh, it is different from gene expression uh, analysis and also the time frame. So the gamma H2AX is usually done fairly rapidly um, because if you wait for too long, the signal will fade away. Uh, so the gene expression signatures, uh, they say that they are valid uh, up to uh, three days or four days max. And again, it is dependent on the radiation dose. So if you are using very low doses, I think uh, probably you will have an increase and then so then uh, there's a decrease. Um, so we have to look for genes that are uh, differentially regulated by low dose and high dose. And that would be an ideal option, uh, but we are not yet there. Mm. Okay, good. All right, uh, well, we have two questions. Uh, I know one of them is kind of a quick question, but the First one, um, it says, would you, would you explain the difference between, and, and I apologize if I'm kind of misrepresenting this, but G sub Y and uh, S sub V, what is the radiation weighting factor? Sorry? So uh, explain the difference between uh, G Y and S V, and again, I'm probably, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the variable variables there, but the difference between G, I assume sub Y or G Y and then S V, and then what's the radiation weighting factor? Uh, so the radiation weighting factor for photons is actually one. 
um, for alpha particles is 20. Um, so you mean that gray and Siebert? So I see so. I'm and flipping and through your slides to make sure to get, try to get familiar. Yeah, I mean, the question is written if you could uh, explain the difference between GY and SV. So actually, exposure doses are always expressed in the international unit gray, and uh, Sieverts is actually um, the absorbed radiation dose. Um, so basically, equivalent dose and the effective dose are usually expressed in Sieverts, I believe. Okay, now yeah, fair enough. All right, well, um, in the interest of time, one kind of final question here should be uh, an easy one. So did, did, did you speak correctly? Did you say that the reacts can provide up to 2000 dose estimates per day using DCA? No, 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 no. I okay. talked about Columbia University Medical Center because they developed the rabbit, uh, rapid um, uh, biodosimetry tool. Uh, no, yeah. we cannot. <laughs> so okay. we are trying to automate the DCA, and uh, our goal is to um, do at least 500 samples uh, once everything is automated. Oh no, no, we are uh, we are no way near to that uh, thousands of samples. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Figured that might be a quick answer for that one. All right. Great. Well, uh, it is the the top of the hour here. Um, I appreciate the time. We'll we'll get and wrap it up here. Um, thank you again, Dr. Balaji, for the presentation and for everyone for attending. Uh, again, the presentation is posted on the website, and we'll get this uh, the actual presentation here um, available as well sometime soon. So keep an eye out for that. So again, thank you, Balaji, Dr. Balaji, for your time. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, it was a pleasure to do that. Okay. Likewise. Take care. Bye. Bye.